All right, hello, my beautiful friends, and welcome back to the Cozy Representative. It's your man back up in here. Just wanted to say before we get into things, uh, I was out in the sun quite a lot yesterday. I'm a little burnt up right now. I don't know if you can see on my arms, I'm like a red lobster right now. It's crazy. I'm putting aloe vera on my skin. It hurts. I'm crispy, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm still here rocking with you today. So just try to ignore my uh, my my burntness. It's summertime, baby. All right. Anyways, let's get into it, shall we? So in one of my recent videos, uh, we talked about Katie Hudson. That's the TV it has like 600 channels. I've never had that many channels in my life. Uh, this is a show that our MC is on. It's Survivor, New Zealand style. Treasure Island. Treasure Island. A sheltered young 16 year old girl uh, who came from a strict, super religious family. She had moved to Nashville after getting her GED and leaving high school so she could pursue a singing career, uh, releasing a self titled debut Christian album in 2001 on a Christian record label. <laughs> It's fun. I mean, all kinds of people. It's a bit hard and it's a bit... It's good. It's my first store. It's one of the best Christian bands. So I'm like on tour with them, hanging out with them, and they actually laugh at my jokes. However, my friends, due to her label going bankrupt and ceasing operation shortly after the release of her debut, it's not a very good thing to have happen. Uh, Katie Hudson's stint as a Christian Nashville singer-songwriter was cut short. However, she was unknowingly on the crest of a much, much greater horizon. She moved to LA, Los Angeles, the big city, at age 17 uh, to pursue a career in non-religious music. I don't want to talk, I'm going to explode. And after a couple more failed attempts at a debut album being signed and dropped by a couple different major labels, um, you know, some years of turmoil, there were a few times where it seems like it wasn't going to happen for Katie. Once 2008 rolled around, Katie Hudson was now 23 years old and she finally released her actual major label debut album, one of the boys under her new name, Katy Perry. Now, one of the boys was a real reinvention for the young singer, right? And there was a very long, winding, bumpy road to get to the release of the album. But it was totally worth it, as one of the boys was an absolute commercial success, smash hit, multiple chart-topping songs. And while it did shoot her to a place of mainstream, as well as kind of indie stardom, too, one of the boys would also serve as, you know, somewhat of a stepping stone to her next album, 2010's Teenage Dream, which would undoubtedly launch her to even bigger heights of like Madonna level pop world superstardom. So one of the boys was very important for Katy Perry. This era of hers was fresh and unique and overall, uh, this time period for Katy was a real rich, vibrant moment in 2000s pop culture as a whole. Uh, and there's a very fascinating tale of how it all came together. So my friends, friends of the Cozy Representative, that's me. Uh, welcome to the video. We're going to talk about the Katy Perry album that uh, almost never was. Take my hand. Join me. Let's go. Let's see how the magic came together. So let's pick back up right where we left off in my last video. I think it was two videos ago, if you go on my channel. Uh, if you're just tuning into this one out of the blue, I might recommend watching that other one first. Either way, we find ourselves in the year 2002. 22 years ago as of me filming this. <laughs> Katie Hudson is 17 years old, and after the commercial failure, and even like the indie failure of her debut album, it only sold like 100 copies before her label went bankrupt, uh, <laughs> and ceased operation. No more Katie Hudson album promotion. Katie did some soul searching and decided to move to LA, Los Angeles, and pursue a career in secular, non-religious pop music. 
Due to similarities between her stage name, Katie Hudson, which is her actual name, uh, and the famous actress Kate Hudson, to avoid confusion and carve out kind of a new identity for herself in 2003, uh, fun fact, Katie actually briefly began performing under the name Catherine Perry, Perry being her mother's maiden name, before ultimately going by Katie Perry. In 2003, Katy Perry was born, <laughs> making her 21 years old now in 2024. Just kidding. Anyways, allegedly, uh, the first song she ever wrote when she moved to L.A., not the first song she ever wrote ever, but the first song she wrote upon moving to L.A. was a song called Thinking of You. Because when Keep that in your head, because that song will reappear again later in the story. Anyways, between 2004 and 2006, there were a couple different major record deals she landed uh, with a couple different failed attempts at a debut record. I find this era of Katie very fascinating. Let's talk about it. So fun fact... 17-year-old Katie relocating to Los Angeles coincided with her linking up with a legendary big-time uh, pop songwriter producer who had been in the game for years, a guy named Glenn Ballard. I remember um, having a conversation with a writer and they were saying, okay, so if you could write or make a record with anybody, or just work with anybody or meet anybody, who would you want her to be? And I had no reference point because, I mean, I didn't know anything. I went home that night and I went to the hotel room and I turned on the TV and up popped an interview with Alanis Morissette and uh, Glenn Ballard and he was talking about Jagged Little Pill and I was like, I know that song. I came back the next day and I said, uh, I like I like to meet that guy, and he's like, okay, well, we'll we'll try and set up a meeting. And I had my father drive me up to LA. I went in there and I sang him a song and got a call the next day saying, oh yeah, I've been looking for you. So he developed me over um, like three years and always encouraged me. He said, write a song every single day. And I'm like, write a song every single day. Like Katie just said, he's known for co-writing and producing Alanis Morissette's 1995 classic, Jagged Little Pill, uh, an album which Katie's own 2001 debut album was compared quite a bit to. Uh, so Katie, you know, that was a selling point for Katie. Glenn Ballard was also involved in the production of, uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy, but Michael Jackson's albums Thriller, Bad, and Dangerous. Not quite sure who that is, but um, no, I'm just that that was a joke. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Don't don't freak out. I know who Michael Jackson is. That wasn't even a funny joke. I don't even know what I'm talking about. I should just be telling you the story. I'm putting in all these bad jokes. But yeah, Glenn Ballard, Thriller, Bad and Dangerous by Michael Jackson. He had a hand in uh production on those albums, so this dude is a pop. Heavyweight. To quote uh, Katy Perry's 2010 Rolling Stone cover story, Sex, God, and Katy Perry, great title, regarding Glenn Ballard, quote, Ballard was immediately smitten with her. Quote, when Katy's father brought her to my studio, so her parents were supportive of this, when Katy's father brought her to my studio, I thought she was just going to hand me some music to hear, says Ballard, but she came in with her guitar and sat right down to play me a song. At that moment, I thought she was extraordinary. She never had any fear, end quote. So in 2004, uh, Katy Perry officially signed with Glenn Ballard's record label, which was called Java Records, which was a subsidiary, uh, like, imprint label off of Island Def Jam, with plans uh, for an album release in 2005. In a December 2004 article on Glenn Ballard in Billboard magazine, it states the following, quote, 
Ballard has also made five videos for Java slash Columbia artist Katy Perry. I don't know why it says Java Columbia, because Java was, according to all my other research, an imprint of Island Def Jam. So maybe Billboard was wrong? I don't know. Um, Java Columbia artist Katy Perry, whose debut will be released stateside in March. It then goes on to say that Ballard says this is one of the most exciting times of his career. All right, check it out, y'all. Are you ready for some fun little factoids? So I was trying to find more information about this uh, this canceled 2005 Katy Perry debut album. I guess technically her second album, but we're just calling this debut because the, the Christian one, that was like a different, it's like her evening out with your girlfriend. You know what I mean? It's like not the real debut. This is her attempt at a real debut. I was looking for more uh, information about this. It turns out there's a whole Katy Perry.fandom.com Wikipedia out there. The stands went crazy and made Katy her own Wikipedia. And the <laughs> there's a lot of cool information on here. Um, so her, the, the 2005 scrapped original album was uh, uh, allegedly going to be called, in parentheses, A Katy Perry. I don't quite know what that title means or signifies, but A in parentheses, Katy Perry. This is allegedly the cover art. Pretty cool. The wiki page for this album on the Katy Perry wiki. <laughs> the Wikipedia page for this album on the Katy Perry wiki states, uh, in an interview with Blender, Perry revealed the album was due in 2005, stating, quote, my album will be more rock, which is probably why my parents think I'm going to hell. <laughs> also from that Billboard article I just quoted uh, about Glenn Ballard, where it said that there were five videos that Katy Perry made. What happened with those? Well, there's more info on here. Apparently, uh, Katy Perry was set to release a promotional DVD in fall of 2004, promoting herself and the album. However, only a teaser of the DVD ended up being uh, released. The teaser included clips of the five videos that Katy had shot uh, for songs that were called Diamonds, Simple, Long Shot, Box, a Cup of Coffee, and It's Okay to Believe, which is six songs, so that's more than five. <laughs> Duh. And Katie is also credited as Catherine Perry in the videos, so that's pretty interesting. <laughs> And this is also the, uh, apparently the alleged track list off of the shelved 2005 A. Katy Perry album. Pretty cool. None of these songs ended up on One of the Boys, but, um... A few of them would reappear in just a moment, so let's let's keep going with this story, shall we? So as the gears were turning for this original Katy Perry album to come out, as happens in the music industry quite frequently, unfortunately, label BS caused the album to be shelved because, as I said, Glenn Ballard's label Java, who was supposed to put the album out, was like a subsidiary off of Island Def Jam. Uh, Island Def Jam ended up dropping Java Records off of their roster. I've also seen some articles that say that Glenn Ballard cut ties with Island Def Jam on his own accord. Either way, uh, Java Records basically no longer <laughs> existed. Another record label that Katy Perry was working with had folded, unfortunately. So this album got shelved, unfortunately. However, uh, from the shelved 2005 Katy Perry album, A Katy Perry, a song of hers called Simple, um, which there was a video for on that, like, planned promotional DVD, a song called Simple, came out on the soundtrack to the movie The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants in 2005, uh, which has a, the song has a cool vibe, and the, the, the music video uh, has a very cool vibe, too. So 
So at least something from this album saw the light of day on the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants soundtrack. <laughs> so in her Rolling Stone 2010 cover story, she states the following about this time in her life. Quote, I was in Beverly Hills with my new Jetta, thinking that my album was about to come out, and I was so excited, she said. Then nothing happened. It was like, wow, my car is getting repossessed. I have no money. I'm living on Cahuenga under the Hollywood sign. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but that was her quote. She was facing some rough times after this, unfortunately. Uh, so although Glenn Ballard didn't have Java Records anymore, uh, he hadn't given up on Katie quite yet, and he introduced her to a guy named Tim Devine, a legendary A&R rep over at Columbia Records. This guy's another... Total pop music big wig. He signed Mazzy Star and Train, <laughs> just to name a couple. It might not sound that impressive, but those are giant artists. He's also done A and R for records by people like Paul McCartney, the Beastie Boys, the Beach Boys, uh, Aerosmith, The Offspring, and tons more. So this is this is another big pop guy. After Ballard introduced Katie to Tim Devine at Columbia Records, Columbia ended up buying the masters for Katie's unreleased Java record, A. Katy Perry. Columbia planned to release the record, uh, but they had Katie start work on a couple of new songs, co-writing with people like Desmond Child, Butch Walker, and Dr. Luke. Uh, but after the forward progress that Katie had started making with her sound on these newer songs, the entire original 2005 Java album ended up being scrapped uh, with plans of her starting over on something newer, bigger, and even better. <laughs> So on Columbia Records, she began work on an album titled Fingerprints, which was originally slated for release in 2007. Uh, I found some artwork that had been made uh, for this album. This was supposedly going to be the album cover. These were some promo shots, as you can see. Um, cool vibes we got going on here. We're getting closer and closer to like the full vision that Katie ended up having on one of the boys. This was basically like an earlier version of, of one of the boys, both musically and aesthetically. Pretty cool. So I think it actually would have been pretty cool if this album had come to fruition. I also think it would have been cool if the 2005 one had come to fruition. Katy Perry, by the time, uh, just, just a little side note, but by the time one of the boys came out in 2008, that that was actually her like third or fourth album, realistically. Uh, this one, Fingerprints, basically being her third at this point, quote unquote. Um, but I really like the vibe of the songs which have surfaced from this specific attempt at a Katy Perry debut. The songs have a very alt rock kind of, uh, like I would say like a fancy boutique pop rock kind of vibe, if that makes sense, check out the song Long Shot, which a music video was made for. However, unfortunately, the music industry is gonna music industry, you know what I'm saying? Katie faced yet another setback. According to Tim Devine, that other big pop guy's Wikipedia page, around 2007, Columbia Records had some key people who were involved with Katie's Fingerprints album resign from the label, and Katie was among several artists who were then dropped from Columbia, causing Fingerprints to be shelved. Now, it's a fact that fingerprints were shelved. But could there be more to the story? According to the 2010 Rolling Stone Katy Perry cover story that I've quoted a couple times already, quote, the plug was pulled at the last moment because the company didn't think 
the timing was right. A source close to Perry says that they were concerned over small details, like the fact that her haircut was too similar to Ashley Simpson's, who was hot at that moment. Interesting. I think both things could have, uh, you know, been at play. People leaving Columbia and also Columbia having some debt. Because, you gotta understand, there were a few uh, giant hits, like I Kissed a Girl and Hot and Cold, and even You're So Gay. We're gonna get to all that in a second. I'm jumping ahead. But those three songs hadn't even been written yet. And I can see how without those smash hits and more of a pop rock, almost more rock in general, indie pop rock kind of sound for Katie, I could see how they, you know, the label might have been worried about her getting lost in the shuffle. Like, I, <laughs> like that's kind of messed up with the, oh, it's too similar to Ashley Simpson comparison. But like, I also kind of, I kind of maybe see where they're coming from a little bit. You know what I mean? Ugh, the major label music industry world, man. It's a, it's a crazy place. It's cutthroat. It does not care about your feelings as an artist or a fan. They only care about the dollars. Well, they, they don't only care about the dollars, but they like mostly care about the dollars. Anyways, I mean, I guess when you're trying to craft a pop superstar, it becomes more about business than anything else, really. But anyways, let's, <laughs> let's fucking keep going. So regardless, a good handful of the songs from this, this unreleased Katy Perry record, Fingerprints, did see the light of day in other forms. Uh, some of the songs were given to other artists. Longshot and I Do Not Hook Up were given to Kelly Clarkson. And Rock God was given to Selena Gomez and The Scene. And several other fingerprint songs would go with Katie and would end up seeing the light of day uh, on her real debut full length, One of the Boys, which did get released. Uh, but more on all that in just a minute. A couple small fun facts about this Katy Perry era before we move on. Uh, just a couple things I wanted to include. Katie provided backing vocals on Mick Jagger's song, Old Habits Die Hard, which was included on the soundtrack to the 2004 film Alfie. Interesting. She also recorded background vocals on the P.O.D. single Goodbye For Now, as well as being featured at the end of the music video for the song, and she also performed it with them on The Tonight Show. Pretty cool. Her and P.O.D., right? How about that? Last but certainly not least, I talked about this a little bit in the last Katy Perry video, but during this time, she also began dating Gym Class Heroes frontman Travi McCoy, and she was featured in their 2007 music video for their big hit single, Cupid's Chokehold, where she played her real-life role of Travi's girlfriend in the music video, and it was very sweet. Hashtag 2007 couple goals. So... Let's get our bearings. It's 2007, Katie has been dropped from Columbia Records after having been dropped from Island Def Jam and Java, and her album Fingerprints is shelved. The second one of her albums to be shelved. Things aren't looking good for Katie, theoretically, but luckily Katie had been doing music in LA long enough that her name was out there now. Big pop people knew about her. She had buzz in like real giant music industry circles, enough so that she signed another deal with Capitol Records that year in 2007. She got <laughs> dropped by Columbia and signed to Capitol in one year. That's pretty crazy. Capitol believed that she could be a breakthrough smash, and they thought some of the songs from the Fingerprints Project would be good enough to release. However, they arranged for her to work with mega songwriter Dr. Luke, unfortunately, <laughs> you know, to work on uh, what they described as an undeniable smash to add to her existing material. So for her Capitol debut, they took some songs from Fingerprints such as Thinking of You, Self-Inflicted, Waking Up in Vegas, and the song Fingerprints. Uh, it's also rumored and debated that songs like I'm Still Breathing, If You Can Afford Me, Lost, and the song One of the Boys were also written for Fingerprints too. That's like a maybe. Uh, and they also took the new songs that she wrote with Dr. Luke, which these songs were the uh, attempts at undeniable smash hits 
Those two songs were I Kissed a Girl and Hot and Cold. As well as some other new material, some other new Katie songs, songs like Mannequin and You're So Gay, uh, and all of that culminated onto finally, whew, her real actual debut in 2008, finally getting released, One of the Boys. So before the release of One of the Boys in late 2007, a digital EP uh, entitled You're So Gay. So we're still in 2007 here. That's crazy. All this, so much happened in 07. <laughs> so in late 07, a digital EP entitled You're So Gay, named after the song, uh, was released to the world, officially introducing Katy Perry to the masses. And this EP was, it was basically uh, just the song You're So Gay, like kind of released as a single with some bonus tracks. It also has a remix of You're So Gay. Um, whenever there's a remix tra as the second track on an EP, in my eyes, it's like, okay, this isn't like a real EP. It's more of like a single, but as a remix of You're So Gay and as a cover of Your Love by The Outfield, uh, again, uh, and then a cover on an EP, it's like, okay, this, is, this isn't this is like a, an actual, like, full-fledged piece, right? Anyways, that's kind of beside the point, but it had a cover of Your Love by The Outfield, uh, and the fourth track was the song Lost, which would be the slow song ballad, which would appear on one of the boys. So regardless, the edgy, kitschy, controversial, yet elegant and boutique, a kind of Williamsburg hipster sounding song, You're So Gay, made actually quite a splash upon release. This was kind of intended to be sort of the underground, like, start to Katy Perry's career, but it ended up being a pretty big song. Fucking Madonna came out and said it was her favorite song at the time. Doesn't get much bigger than that. So, You're So Gay. I want to talk about this song a little bit because, uh, you know, it's one of those songs where, much like, I don't know, a lot of stuff from the 2000s, like, uh, you know, a lot of old Eminem songs or, like, things like that, it was funny and, like, seemingly kind of harmless by 2000s standards of, like, whatever, social politics. But with the passing of time, you know, if you put a magnifying glass up to the lyrics uh, and judge it by, I guess, today's standards, there's plenty of ways you can call this song out for being, quote-unquote, problematic. And many people have over the years. The song's chorus revolves around the line, you're so gay and you don't even like boys. So in the 2000s, <laughs> and, I, and I just want to preface this by saying I'm speaking from a place of I was there in the 2000s, like when this was happening. I'm speaking from a place of experience as someone who took part in this era of culture. Uh, there was a silly kind of tongue-in-cheek phrase called metrosexual. It's not a phrase that anybody uses anymore, and <laughs> it wasn't even a phrase that anyone actually used seriously back in the 2000s either. I'm telling you, from what I remember, it was a term pretty much only used in jest. Nobody actually claimed this term or, like, seriously called anybody else metrosexual. Regardless, so what is metrosexual? Metrosexual refers to uh, straight men who... Well, you know what? Let's just refer to the 2005 Urban Dictionary entry of the word, shall we? Urban Dictionary says, A normally straight male who possesses qualities of a gay male without being attracted to men. A metro often appreciates the finer things in life and enjoys making himself look good, be it through styling his hair or wearing fashionable clothes. Person one, is he gay? Person two, no, he does dress well, but he has a wife. Person one, oh, he must be metro then. <laughs> so it's a straight guy who grooms himself, essentially. And it makes <laughs> sense that this phrase came from this era in the 2000s because this really, <laughs> like, unironically actually was a, a phenomenon at the time. And for me, uh, growing up an emo kid, it kind of coincides with the emo movement. And myself growing up as an emo kid, I mean, by definition, like, I was metrosexual, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> And most of my friends absolutely were too. Uh, the guys in Panic at the Disco, Pete Wentz, those guys, 
all metrosexual, okay? Ryan Ross, as far as I know, is straight, yet he was still dressing like this. Metrosexual. Again, no one ever claimed that term or took it seriously. I'm telling you, as far as I remember, it was just a funny thing. It was kind of just taking the piss, you know? Metrosexual. Anyways, but it was a thing. And in Katy Perry's You're So Gay, it's basically kind of a commentary on those types of dudes. She portrays her frustration with dating a guy like a Pete Wentz or... <laughs> A Ryan Ross, who had all of these qualities of a stereotypical gay man, but as far as everyone knows, is straight. I hope you hang yourself with your H&M scarf while jacking off listening to Mozart. You bitch and moan about L.A. wishing you were in the rain reading Hemingway. You don't eat meat and drive electrical cars. You're so indie rock, it's almost an art. You need SPF 45 just to stay alive you're so gay and you don't even like boys. So I think it's pretty obvious that the song is meant to be funny and only really to be taken at surface level as kind of a goof, right? But if you take a closer look at it, if you take a look, if you take the message of this song seriously, right? If you look at it through like real serious eyes, uh, one could make the claim that it's problematic because it's essentially shaming men who, even regardless of their sexuality, you know, don't want to conform to the typical status quo of traditional, quote-unquote, manliness. In the song, she's like, you're basically a gay man. Why don't you just, you know, be gay? Well, what if this supposed straight guy is actually wanting to explore his sexuality, right? Maybe he is bi or gay, and he's just not out yet, not comfortable with that side of himself yet, whatever it may be, you're essentially pressuring this guy to come out, Katy Perry. That's not very nice. Or what if the guy is straight, but he's just built a little different, you know what I mean? He likes to act a little feminine, a little gay. Who cares? Let him. <laughs> Why do we have to you know, abide by these stereotypical gender roles, am I right? And look, I total like, those arguments, I agree with those, like, uh, critiques of this song. I think that those criticisms are valid, but, but, there's a big but which comes after, though. Um, you know, because this song, like, yeah, it's not, like, PC, it's a little ignorant, but... I'm willing to bet you any amount of money that Katy Perry herself at this point in time <laughs> would agree with, would look back and not exactly, you know, would agree with those critiques and be like, yeah, it's not, I don't really stand by that now. I mean, that's just speculation. But anyways, see, let me tell you my thoughts. I think at the end of the day, this is just my opinion, when this song was made, it was so meant to be so lighthearted. It was not supposed to be some like political statement or or social commentary aside from all the buzz around quote unquote metrosexual men at the time. It's a silly fun in the sun Katy Perry song from 2007. It's like an ancient relic at this point. It's not that deep basically is how I feel. It's not hurting anybody, right? It's only it only really becomes shady when you look at it from a different perspective, but you know, like I said, I'm a guy who's very much legitimate like you know, in the 2000s, you know, I was definitely could be referred to as a metrosexual. These days I am more on the I don't know, bisexual side of things, and I personally think this song is funny. I don't feel oppressed by this song. I think it's funny. I don't think anybody's like, you know, I don't think this song is like hurting anybody. Anyways, that's You're So Gay. Those are just my thoughts. That's just how I feel about it. I basically don't think it's that deep. I don't know. But it's worth bringing up and talking about because, again, it is like the lyrics to the song are at this point like a relic of a different time, you know? I don't, you couldn't really put this song up. Again, even though the song, the lyrics aren't really that big of a deal, in my opinion, like you couldn't really put this song out now because more people would be like, yo, what the fuck is this? Like, you know, what are you talking about? There's, there's different updated, like more contemporary ways of being uh kitschy and silly and poking fun at each other than the way it was portrayed back almost 20 years ago on you're so gay you guys feel me i don't know am i do you do you feel what i'm saying do you agree disagree i don't know those are just my thoughts anyways 
that's your So Gay. Uh, I'm going to spend the rest of this video getting into the actual album itself, and then we'll call it a day and I'll get out of your hair. So, the album itself, the long-awaited actual Katy Perry debut, was finally released on June 17th. 2008 on Capitol Records. Production was handled by a long list of the world's top pop producers, people like Max Martin, Dr. Luke, Glenn Ballard, obviously, Butch Walker, Sam and Sluggo, and more. The first single, another controversial queer-themed summer anthem, I Kissed a Girl was released as a single on April 28th of 2008, and this was the song which absolutely blew up Katy Perry. How are you? First of all, 15 weeks on the Billboard chart with that song, seven at number one. How does that feel? Um, I never really expected that, you know, grandmas and construction workers would be singing this song, but it's cool. I'm happy. What about the people who say, well, you say this was not meant to be an oh no song. But the critics listen to it and they say, oh no. I mean, it's not your like, I love you, you love me, we're a happy family song. It's definitely got some spice to it. <laughs> and, and do you worry at all about a message or is that something the music has to be separate from that? Um, you know what? I always speak from the heart. I never really censor myself. And I feel like that's what's missing in music these days. It was essentially an instant smash hit. It was catchy, it was fun, it was provocative, it was sexy. You know, it absolutely took America by storm and became just an undeniable hit song forever embedded very prominently into pop culture in the 2000s. You can't talk about 2000s pop culture without, you know, I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry. The lyrics on the chorus are, quote, I kissed a girl and I liked it. I hope my boyfriend don't mind it. Oh, you know what? That's funny, Katy Perry. So you can explore your sexuality here on I Kissed a Girl, but back over on You're So Gay, your boyfriend can't? Double standard, Miss Perry. Not very cool. I'm just kidding. That was a total joke. Uh, but, ha <laughs> ha. See, I can play that game too. I'm just kidding. Regardless, an anthem about a girl kissing a girl, along with her backstory of growing up super religious and first debuting in 2001 as a Christian artist, gave Katie an interesting story and kind of an edge to her uh, in the pop world, which helped her catch the attention of audiences worldwide. And the song is just, at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's just an undeniable smash hit pop song. I think anybody could have sang this song, really, and it would have been a, a, a hit, you know. The song was went number one on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 and stayed there for seven consecutive weeks, uh, which is crazy. The summer of 2008 was absolutely the summer of I Kissed a Girl by Katy Perry. The next single off the album uh, was the other song Katy Perry worked on with Dr. Luke, Hot and Cold. This was released as a single on September 9th of 2008, and while it wasn't as big of a cultural moment as I Kissed a Girl became. It was another bona fide smash hit. It hit number three on the Billboard Hot 100, uh, and it sits today as definitely the second most popular song from this album, and uh, still one of Katie's most popular songs in general. The third single was Thinking of You, which, remember back earlier in the video, I told you to remember that song. Well, here it comes. It, it, this song appeared on one of the boys and it was the third single from the album. The first song she wrote when she moved to LA back in 2003 or whatever that was. So this song being released as a single, I actually think is pretty cool. That must've been a very meaningful, like full circle moment for Katie. And I also feel like in this song, you can kind of hear the uh, musical stylings of her 2001 debut a little bit, you know, that kind of Alanis Morissette, like singer-songwriter kind of vibe. It's a little bit more of an emotional kind of track. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a little bit of OG Katie. And you can kind of, t again, this being a single, I think is cool. Full circle moment. Uh, it debuted as a single on January 12th of 2009. Um, uh, this one hit number 29 on the Hot 100. So, you know, not quite as big as the two singles preceding it, but hey, it's still a top 40 hit, you know, I remember this song being a single, so that's definitely, you know, it's, I wouldn't say it was a total flop, you know, still a big song. Um, the final single from the album was Waking Up in Vegas, which was one of the songs originally written for the Fingerprints album, uh, released as a single on April 21st of 2009. This song hit number nine 
on the Hot 100. Aw oh, yeah, baby, we're back up in the top 10. Another big hit for Katy Perry. Waking up in Vegas to me, this is just a little side thing, but uh, it almost has like a, it straddles the line between sounding like a, uh, like a neon, like pop rock band of the era. Like this almost sounds like it could be like a boys like girls song or like the main or, you know, some artist like that. But it's also like, if you think about it, like I've, I feel like this song almost is like pop country kind of vibes in other ways, not in the actual execution of the song. Like if you just listen to it, it's not like a pop country song, but if you played this song on just on an acoustic guitar and sang it with like a Southern accent, it'd be like a total pop country song. Do you know what I'm saying? Shut up and put your money where your mouth is. That's what you get for waking up in Vegas. I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? I don't have a good singing voice or Southern accent, but that's how <laughs> I kind of imagine it. And overall, this debut Katy Perry album, One of the Boys, I mean, although it's definitely like as a whole at the end of the day, it's a mainstream pop album. If you listen to it, you can really hear um, a lot of that kind of neon pop rock style that was popping at the time, like Boys Like Girls kind of world. You know, songs like Hot and Cold, Self-Inflicted, If You Can Afford Me, you know, sound very like, <laughs> I don't know, the Academy is Fast Times at Barrington High sound. I mean, they, Katy Perry worked with Sam and Sluggo on the song, If You Can Afford Me, and Sam and Sluggo worked with the Academy is and Boys Like Girls and Cobra Starship and all of those like neon pop artists. Um, I, they also worked with Gym Class Heroes. I'm pretty sure that's how like Katie and Travi McCoy met, you know? So she was working with some neon pop people and there is kind of a neon warp tour kind of vibe going on here throughout this album. She did even perform at uh, the 2008 Vans Warp Tour. <laughs> which was, you know, a big deal at the time. I don't think anybody really predicted or like people definitely knew that like, oh, this is kind of a different artist to be playing Warp Tour. It's like this new pop girl, but people I don't think people even really understood at the time that like Katie was going to become this like gigantic, like I was saying earlier, like basically Madonna level worldwide pop superstar. She was just blowing up. Um, when she did the Warp Tour in 2008. And uh, I actually have a quick funny story. I The Warp Tour 2008, I was there at the Boston date. And um, that was the first Warp Tour I ever went to. And uh, funny enough to bring up the Academy is, um, I remember specifically on that day, Kate, there's a true story. Katy Perry and Panic at the Di or not Panic at the Disco, Katy Perry <laughs> and the Academy is, sorry, the Academy is, um, Katy Perry and the Academy is were playing at around the exact same time. It was a little bit later in the afternoon, around five, five o'clock. And, uh, yeah, Katy and the Academy is were playing at the exact same time. And I, like a fucking dingus, went to go see the Academy is instead of Katie. And it's not because I didn't like Katy Perry or anything like that. I thought I was into Katie at the time, but I was just a little bit bigger of a fan of the Academy is. And again, I didn't, as a young person, I didn't realize how important and like cult, what a cultural milestone it was, uh, that, you know, this once in a lifetime opportunity to see Katy Perry play a festival like Warped Tour. So I'm just Watch The Academy Is, Head Empty, and I love The Academy Is. I've, the Academy Is are one of my, you know, my favorite bands in the entire universe, right? I don't regret seeing them. They played a great set, but I'm sure members of The Academy Is would probably understand that I regret not seeing <laughs> Katy Perry. I regret seeing The Academy Is over Katy Perry because 
I saw the Academy as a whole bunch of other times during that period. I had no other opportunity to see Katy Perry play something like Warped Tour. So that's my story of how I didn't see Katy Perry at Warped Tour. But anyways, um, you know, the album, going back to the One of the Boys album, it also has, like I said, kind of this, like, I don't know how to describe it, like boutique pop rock, like almost indie rock, like indie indie pop kind of vibes, like very you know, Brooklyn, New, like hipster Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> Williamsburg hipster, indie sleaze, indie sleaze, that's the term I'm looking for, kind of vibe throughout this album too, not on every song, but like, I don't know, stuff, songs like Mannequin or, or, uh, you know, I don't know, it's kind of more of just a vibe, you're so gay, um, it's kind of just a vibe thing throughout this album, but, you know, I think you can, uh, you know, knowing the backstory of this album and knowing that there were two kind of failed attempts at a Katy Perry debut before it, um, you know, and those albums were kind of more of a rock direction and she was kind of finding her, you know, finding herself, developing herself as an artist throughout all of this with all this help from big pop people. You know, one of the boys is like, you can hear all those different sides of Katie. There's a rock side. There's a straight up pop side, like on I Kissed a Girl. Um, there's, you know, more of a, like I said, boutique indie sleaze kind of vibe on some songs. There's a neon pop rock vibe, you know, as much as it is kind of a vacuum of a lot of stuff uh, that was popular around 06, 07, and 08. Um, it, you know, it's kind of perfectly packaged on this one of the boys, Katy Perry album, you know, it's kind of a perfect representation of like, of like what was cool in the mainstream and also what was cool in like indie circles at the time, but it was packaged in this way that it was super accessible, super pop. Um, and it, you know, it blew Katy up to a giant level. Now, like I was saying earlier, uh, this album did not blow her up to like timeless superstar level. This album did, uh, you know, when this album came out, it was still like Katie could be this like flash in the pan. Like who knows, this could be just her moment and then it goes away. And it was just this, remember that I kissed a girl song, wonder where she's at now. This album didn't blow her up to that next giant, giant superstar level. This album did serve, however, as a stepping stone to get to her next album, 2010's Teenage Dream, you know, featuring, you know, that I think that album beat Michael Jackson's Thriller in terms of, like, how many number one singles it had, you know, teen, uh, the song Teenage Dream, California Girls featuring Snoop Dogg, Firework, This Friday Night, E.T., I mean, fuck, that album just completely just blew her up to the next level. But with that being said, I'm going to cut this video off there because that was the story of one of the boys, uh, one of my favorite pop albums from the 2000s and, um, you know, an album that I was definitely listening to in middle school. I think I mentioned this in my first Katy Perry video, but, uh, you know, I was in middle school when this album uh, came out. And, you know, although I went to see the Academy is instead of Katy Perry at Warp Tour, I was into this album. It appealed to me as kind of a... Uh, you know, an alt leaning kid at the time who like, I was like alternative, like warp tour punk stuff, but I really did like, uh, I was drawn to catchy music, like almost over anything, like even of the, the, the warp tour, uh, alt, alt punk stuff, even of that stuff, I was always drawn to the more catchy poppy bands. And Katy Perry was like one of the first, like actual, like straight up pop artists, uh, that in, in my coming of age era of life that I really like was interested in and kind of connected with this album. Um, and yeah, I don't know. It's just a cool story. So, uh, thank you for joining me on this, uh, tale of the road to one of the boys by Katy Perry. And, um, if you want more of this guy, me, if you want some bonus, stuff and if you want to help support the channel financially for just five dollars a month I, I hate to do a little advertisement i always feel so fucking you know i'm not trying to be whatever but i'm just i have i have a patreon account is what i'm saying if you want to help support thank you to these people on the screen for supporting every month um on there lately i've been doing uh so 
let me give you a little update on the Patreon. In the past, like, few months on my channel, I've been experimenting with kind of my version of, like, reaction videos where I've watched some old-school Panic! at the Disco interviews, some old-school Fall Out Boy interviews, um, and kind of watched and done, like, reaction-type videos to them. Um, I've decided to move those type of videos over to the Patreon. So... At least once a month, you'll be getting a new, like, sort of, quote-unquote, reaction-style video from me of, like, looking at an old band interview from the 2000s or really just any sort of interesting piece of of, uh, of media from the time. There will be at least one per month. Um, just uh, earlier this month, I watched uh, an old Boys Like Girls interview from 2009, which I thought was kind of cringy and funny the interview was and I watched and reacted to it so that is up on the Patreon I'm going to be doing a lot more of those in the coming months so if you want to support the channel just five dollars a month um, and and you'll get bonus footage and you'll help me be able to do more videos like this here on YouTube and thank you once again to these people who support over there was there anything else I wanted to say before I ended this video no I don't think so just thank you guys for uh sticking with me and supporting the channel. I love making videos and I don't plan on stopping anytime soon. So thank you guys. And I, and it wouldn't be possible without you guys helping me along the way. So, you know, whether it be supporting the Patreon or just watching the channel, subscribing, what, you know, whatever it is. So thank you very much. I appreciate you. And, uh, I hope everyone's having a good summer out there and, um, yeah, I'll catch you next time right here on the cozy representative. I love you. Peace out.